Okay, well, welcome back to the um, second uh, lecture for the Deep NLP course. Uh, so today um, we've got uh, Ed Greffenstedt here to um, talk to you all about lexical semantics. That's the how to learn uh, word meanings. Um, so a brief sort of introduction of Ed. Ed's actually, I think he first came to Oxford as an MSc student uh, a number of years ago. Uh, continued on to do a DPhil, uh, a postdoc, and has ended up now in the um, language group at DeepMind. Uh, so he's a, he's a, a long friend of um, Oxford. So um, thank you, Ed. Take it away. Okay. Yeah, thanks for coming. Um, so today's lecture, as Phil said, is about learning uh, word representations um, that will be either independently useful or serve as input to a neural network, um, since this is a course about deep learning for NLP and a frequent source of information about language is the vast swath of text that we have on the internet and documents and emails, and we want to be able to apply models to that. Um, neural networks require continuous or at least vector representations as their inputs, so it stands to reason that we want some way of putting text in the form of uh, words into these networks somehow. Um, there won't be a lot of deep learning in this lecture, but it's a, I think it's a, there will, we'll be exploring a few concepts that are prerequisites for understanding um, models studied in the rest of the course. Um, so a little bit maybe about the sort of general history of this. So um, natural language text, in fact formal languages, are uh, sequences of discrete symbols. Um, we'll be talking about words as our basic unit, but obviously you know, characters are a, a reasonable basic unit as well, morphemes, maybe phrases. Um, but we'll be focusing on words today and uh, later in the course, uh, Chris Dyer will talk a bit about uh, learning representations at the subword level. Um, so how do we represent words in a way that a neural network can um, take them as input, or in fact, in a way that we can feed to any classifier of uh, any flavor? Uh, well, the most naive representation you could have for words, by the way, if anyone has questions at any point in the lecture, please feel free. This should be interactive and, and uh, there are no dumb questions. Well, there are, but the, so the most naive representation that you could possibly imagine is to simply encode your, uh, your words as uh, unique identifiers for that particular word type. So uh, one hot vector, which is a vector where one element is one and everything else is zero, is a nice way of encoding uh, unique, uh, unique types. Uh, if you want to encode all the words in your vocabulary in this way, you could simply have a, a vector space the size of your vocabulary and each word would be a unique basis of that vector space, which would be obviously very large if you have a large vocabulary. Um, this is a, a, a sort of naive method of encoding, but it's been used in a lot of classical information retrieval models. Uh, so for example, if you wanted to implement a simple information retrieval system, uh, you might model documents as simply the superposition of the word vectors therein. So you, you, you just obtain a single vector of counts over each word, how, many word, how many times a particular word occurs in that document. Uh, when you want to uh, execute a query against your document base, um, you could uh, encode the query as another document, saying it'll just put how many times each word in the query occurs and put that count into the vector. And then have some similarity metric over the vectors. Um, for example, cosine similarity or in a product and uh, your most uh, likely document or your most relevant document in this naive information retrieval system would be the one that most closely matches the query according to your similarity metric. And then you can rank based on similarity if you want to return K results. Similarly, this sort of naive approach uh, has been used in basic word classification problems and topic models. In fact, topic modeling is in the classification problem, ignore that, but it's been used in a variety of uh, simple text processing approaches. Um, there are obvious issues to this representation. Uh, first, the, uh, if you're holding vectors for each of your words in a document in this kind of representation, you're having a lot of very large, very sparse vectors. Um, which can have uh, obvious computational <coughs> issues to it. Uh, but from a more semantic perspective, uh, you're treating each word as being a completely separate orthogonal entity to all the other words, right? The similarity between two words is guaranteed to be zero if they're different words. And on top of that, this is a very, they're very semantically uh, weak representations in that the vector for cat just tells you that it's this particular index in your vocabulary. It doesn't tell you anything about what a cat is and what a cat might relate to and 
uh, things about it being furry and cute and all these things. I like cats. Um, so what do we want? We want richer representations uh, for our words. When do we want them? Now. Um, and we want these representations to be capable of doing several things, but as a starting point, it would be nice if they could express uh, semantic similarity. Tell us at least that uh, cats and kittens are close to each other as concepts. Uh, they're perhaps a little less, they're, they're perhaps mutually less close to the concept of dog, but that these three concepts cluster more closely um, than cat and steamroller, for example, unless you have a very peculiar interpretation of these concepts. Um, one uh, sort of dictum you'll hear, or quote you'll hear a lot in the context of learning representations that have these properties is this quote by J.R. Firth, uh, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. There are many other uh, thinkers in philosophy of language and linguistics that have said similar things, notably Ludwig Wittgenstein, who said in around the 50s as well that, um, the, that meaning is simply use, uh, that we understand language by understanding how it's used in a particular community. Um, and we'll talk today about how, you, about how you can translate this idea into a method or several methods for learning word representations. Um, so we're going to be producing dense vector representations as opposed to these very sparse vector representations based on the context and use of words. There are three main approaches that we'll be covering in this lecture, uh, but the sort of, some of the concepts will be revisited throughout the following lectures. Um, one, the first one we'll see is a count-based method, which is uh, definitely very, of a very different flavor than the more neural network-inspired approaches we'll see in the rest of the course in the later part of the lecture, but is uh, a nice starting point to gain intuitions about what we mean by learning rep word representations based on context. Uh, we'll see a predictive approach where we're going to learn word representations by predicting the context or by having the context predict a word. And finally, we'll talk a bit about task-based or extrinsic approaches to learning word representations, where the representations are learned by how well we, we um, optimize word representations based on how well they help us perform a particular task. Any questions before I launch into this? What's a vector? I heard that over there. No, okay. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so count-based methods. Uh, so this, these have been around for several decades, and they're still, it's still a nice, popular, and cheap way of uh, constructing word representations. Uh, so there are several parts to this, and, and uh, in, in general terms, the procedure is thus. We're going to start by choosing a basis context vocabulary of context words. So this is a set of words in our vocabulary that we choose based on our linguistic intuition or statistics of the corpus. Um, based, and and we, we want these context words to be informative about meaning. So we might not want to include in this, in this set uh, common words like the, uh, some, because these are function words. They don't really tell us things about content, um, at least in, in this particular approach. Uh, you might want to also uh, ignore really very rare words. So a common procedure is to take the top, wor the top K words in your vocabulary, like 1,000 or 10,000, which seems pretty large, um, and exclude you know, function words from a stop word list that you might obtain from your favorite linguistics website. Um, so what we define this basis of the vocabulary as a sort of hyperparameter to our model. And then we're going to have to select a notion of what context is. So there are many complex ways of picking context, but one simple approach, which is surprisingly effective, is to simply say that the context to a particular word is a window of words surrounding it. So W words on either side of the uh, target word that you're learning your representation for. Obviously, you could try, you could, you could do clever things here too. You might want to remove from the window uh, words that, are, that don't have like a dependency relation, that aren't syntactically related, but we're going to keep it simple initially. And once we've defined both of these things, um, we are going to, uh, for each word we want to build a representation for, count the basis vocabulary words that occur uh, on the left and the right window of each instance of our target word, uh, and simply collect those counts in a vector. So here's a little example on how we can learn representations for the concepts or the words uh, cat, kitten, and dog. Um, so we have a mini corpus um, up here, which, where I've already sort of pruned out the, uh, everything that wasn't uh, three words to the left or three words to the right. Um, 
And we're going to use as a basis vocabulary, which I pulled out of nowhere, uh, the words bit, cute, uh, furry, loud, meowed, heard, ran, small. Um, and again, when you're, when you're picking context words, you might want to do clever things like uh, normalize by case. You might want to run a stemmer so that you don't have all the, you, that ran, run, running are all the same context word. Um, but again, these are just details of, of the model. So we look at our corpus and we want to learn vectors for kitten, cat, and cute. So we collect the words that are in their context and are also part of our basis vocabulary. So we ignore words like and and the, which aren't part of the basis vocabulary. And we simply collect a set of the words that occur in the context in our corpus. And then since the, each of these conveniently enough for this example occurs once, we can then translate it into a, a, a vector of counts, um, which in this case looks binary, but obviously the, these could be two, three, four if we had a larger corpus, uh, and where each position is indicated in the order I presented the basis set in. So here we have now a vector for kitten, for cat and dog that are no longer one hot, which are no longer completely sparse. So then if you have these vectors, you can do simple things like compare the similarity of concepts according to the um, corpus you've, you've looked at. Um, so you could use inner product, for example, or cosine measure as a similarity kernel and simply calculate the similarity between your concepts. So here we find that kitten and cat, which uh, just to remind you are both uh, furry, and both purr, both, um, both meow. Um, so kitten and cat are quite similar according to this metric, 0.58. In contrast, cat and dog are a lot less similar and a kitten and dog are completely different. So we get this idea that things that are similar according to what context they appear in cluster in our vector space. Uh, cosines, cosine met, for, the, for these kind of count-based models, uh, the cosine measure is one of the popular sort of similarity metrics that you'll find a lot in the literature, primarily because it's norm invariant. You're normalizing the vectors by their norm, by their length, um, and then you take the inner product of the unit vectors. So that if you had a word that occurred a lot in the corpus and a word that occurred just a few times, you're just checking that they point in the same direction rather than that they point to the same area of your space. Um, so, oh yes, so, so this is a pretty naive approach and it, 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 I mean, we get this nice intuition from this example, but it's a pretty naive approach um, because we're not really capturing uh, some aspects of these co-locational statistics that we might want to capture if we just count. Um, not all words are equally informative. Some words might occur a lot. So if you have a corpus about animals um, and you want to distinguish the concepts of various animals in this corpus, uh, thing, the fact that they all run and have like four or two legs, et cetera, some of these words are just going to occur in the context of all these concepts and not really tell something about whether or not they're similar or different uh, because they're just very frequent words. So there are many statistically motivated uh, vector normalization methods, which I won't go into detail because this is more of an introduction to this concept. But for example, you could uh, normalize the counts by the, taking the term frequency over the inverse document frequency, which is a common normalization method used in information retrieval. You could take pointwise mutual information, et cetera. Um, there are a bunch of survey articles that cover these things by, for example, James Curran in his thesis or by Marco Baroni's group. Um, which you can ask me about if you really care about the more historical <coughs> methods. Um, some of these normalization methods remove the need for norm invariant similarity metrics or actually induce vector representations that are distributions over context so you can use slightly more statistically motivated similarity metrics like taking the KLD, the kobach lieber divergence of the two distributions as a similarity metric. But um, perhaps there are easier ways of uh, addressing this problem of what are salient features and what are not, what context words help you learn the meaning of a particular word and differentiate from others or, or, or project into the same space if they are similar um, uh, without having to find, make, make these sort of high level decisions about your context windows, about uh, your basis vocabulary. Um, so these, the, 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 the first way of moving away from just this simple count-based method are these neural embedding models that you might have heard about. The very popular one is word to vec and we'll talk about that a bit today. What am I doing for time? Um, but before I jump into those, uh, let's think about um, what we've just built in the previous example. So we've collected counts and produced a vector for each uh, 
of our, of our vocabulary words, of our target words. Um, you can think of this collection of vectors as forming a matrix. So the rows of the matrix, or, in some, or depending on your convention, the columns, are the words of your vocabulary you're learning representations for. And the, co and the columns of the matrix are um, the uh, basis words, or the, the features that you've used uh, to represent the meaning of these words. Um, if we want to think from a linear algebraic standpoint about how we would use this matrix as an operation, um, we can represent the symbols in our vocabulary using our initial naive picture of like saying, let's, every word in our vocabulary is a one hot vector. And the representation is retrieved by multiplying that one hot vector by this embedding matrix, which simply retrieves the corresponding row. And this notion of embedding matrix is, um, is, is, is what is going to persist throughout this course as like sort of the entry point into, the, uh, into neural networks when we're going to translate words from discrete symbols into dense representations. But we're going to see how we learn it in a way that's different than just counting. The generic, or at least one generic idea behind embedding learning, so instead of estimating this matrix through counts, actually learning it directly based on some task, is that we're going to um, tune this matrix in order to maximize some score across a corpus. Um, the generic algorithm will explore various instances of, in the form of the Colabra and West embeddings and word to vec models, is that you are going to collect, to learn, a, 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 to learn a particular row of the matrix, you're going to collect all the instances of the word that row corresponds to. Uh, for each instance, we're going to collect its context words according to, for example, the window-based method or um, some other um, heuristic. And we're going to define some scoring function um, over that instance in its context that has free, as free parameters um, some parameters theta, which might be, for example, well, we'll see some examples, and the embedding matrix with an upper bound on the output. And then using that, we're going to define a loss um, that we're going to try and minimize across the corpus and all the words in the corpus that is going to try and maximize, or minimize, minimize it's going to try and maximize the score by minimizing its, its, its negative. Um, by in, in, in minimizing this loss, we're going to estimate, um, we're going to try and estimate optimal sets of parameters in an optimal embedding matrix that minimizes it. Sorry, that's so good. Uh, and then finally use this estimated embedding matrix uh, as, our, as the input to our network, the transform input to our network. So this, well, the design of the scoring fact function matters deeply. It's very easy to design a useless score. So for example, if you, you could define, if, if you just read that previous slide and say, I'm just going to define a scoring function that's going to constantly output my upper bound, that's cool, you're going to satisfy the objective, but you're not going to learn a useful embedding matrix. So a leitmotif throughout the next few models we're going to study is exactly why they, uh, the scoring functions that they implicitly define is, is useful. Ideally, your scorer is going to have to obviously use the embedding matrix that you're optimizing to embed T and produce a representation for it. And the score that it produces uh, should be interpretable, ideally, as a function of how well um, that particular instance of the word is accounted for by its context or vice versa. So how well uh, it reflects its use in um, a corpus of natural language. Um, more so than, for example, if you replaced it with a random word from your vocabulary. And finally, uh, because we're going to be uh, estimating these representations using backpropagation or gradient descent, it'd be nice if the loss was differentiable with regard to the parameters of the model. So a, a first and popular, this is not the, historically the first, but a popular approach to producing embeddings as present in this paper by Colabert and his colleagues in 2011, um, natural language from scratch or something to that effect, I can't remember the exact title. Um, and the idea, and it's a, it's a fairly simple idea that, reflect, that sort of takes all the boxes we saw in the previous uh, two slides. Um, we're going to take as context all the words in a sentence and we're going to jointly learn their representations. So we're going to pass each word in the sentence through the embedding matrix, which is uh, perhaps randomly initialized, and get an initial proposed vector for each of those words. We're going to pass that through a shallow convolution. So this could just be adding them together if you wanted to take the simplest approach, but you could also define a simple convolutional network, which you'll probably see further in the course where I've seen in your introduction to machine learning. Have they? Phil? <laughs> 
Have you seen convolutional networks in, the, in your introduction to machine learning? Okay, okay cool. Uh, so you could pass it through a convolutional neural network, simply add them together, and the aim is you're going to produce a single representation for your sentence, and then you're going to pass that through a scoring function, which just projects that vector into a scalar value. Um, so you can think of all the green bits there as being parametrized by the other, model, the other parameters of your model theta, and the vectors at the bottom are produced by putting your one-hot vectors through E, which is what we're trying to learn here. So the overall network models a function over sentences, G of theta and E, um, which is produced by putting the embeddings of the sentence through the score. So this, this is everyone satisfied that this implements the a scoring function? Right. So there's, there's a trivial uh, sort of solution if you think, okay, I, I just want to maximize the score at the top of this through, back, through, through gradient descent. There's a trivial way in which this model could produce a degenerate solution, which is it could ignore the inputs and just constantly have a strong bias on the final projection that says I want to output a score of one, for example, if that was our upper bound. Um, so in which way can we prevent this network? from ignoring its input and learn good representations by forcing the score to be conditioned on the representations. Well, the solution that Culliber and Weston proposed is to, uh, during training, every time you uh, observe a sentence, you're going, you going to sample a, a, a distractor sentence simply by corrupting one or more words of that sentence. So how many words you corrupt is, is up to you, it's a hyperparameter of the model, but you can think that a simplest case would be you randomly select a word in the sentence and then randomly sample another word from the vocabulary to put it in. So if you had the cat slept and you change that and you have the car slept, that's the distractor sentence. And we're gonna present both sentences to the scoring function and our loss is going to be a hinge loss. So it's going to be one minus the difference between those scores uh, and if that goes below zero, you, you ignore it. So you can think of this as saying, it's like, it's fine if, if, you, if you ignore the input to the score and just output a constant function, trivially, you're also going to output a high score to sentences which are garbage, which you've just put some random words into. So the optimal solution for this model is to have to actually uh, rely on the information within the representations of the word in order to produce a good score. Are there any questions about this? Yes. So what, what is your training data in this sentence? Oh, yes. Yeah, so oh, that's an excellent question. Um, so I didn't go into that sort of detail, but typically, whether you're estimating counts or you're estimating uh, uh, your um, embedding matrix by using, for example, uh, the Culliber and Weston model, um, you typically want to use a large corpus so that you can have like, uh, sufficient use of each word to learn a good representation. But you might want to also think about what you're going to be using the vectors for. So languages used differently across uh, different domains. If you uh, are using uh, a set of, let's see, if you're using, if you're using words to talk about uh, politics, you might use a different vocabulary and different meanings of words because uh, natural language is, can be ambiguous or polysemous than if you were talking about like video games or about computers. I need to come up with richer examples. Um, so it's good to think about training your word embeddings on the same sort of domain, same sort of like vocabulary as what you're going to be using them for. Um, if you have sufficient data, so if you had like enough time, enough computers, and you could just take the, all the Wall Street Journal and all the internet, then you could produce perhaps general purpose embeddings. But in practice, that's not computationally feasible, especially um, with uh, the sort of computers we have here. Um, and you, you simply uh, take your corpus that's sufficiently large uh, about your target domain. But what is the correct score in this, in this setup? Um, so the score, it, it, that's more of an implementation detail, but for example, you could bound the score at the top by saying that there's a maximum. So you put the projection into the scalar through, let's say, a sigmoid. So it's the score between zero and one. Um, this, there's no objective notion of a score. You're basically, the, the there's no real objective notion of the score. You're just trying to maximize the score. Um, and the, the purpose of the distractor sentences is to force you to you know, not give good scores to, bat to sentences which don't belong from your corpus. Sorry, is that, is that, that's perhaps a little unclear. So the, oh, sorry. The, um, so let's, let's, let's revisit this. Um, 
this, these, the, the scoring function is being applied to a sentence which belongs in your corpus and a corrupted sentence which doesn't belong in your corpus because you've just taken a sentence from your corpus and replaced random words. Um, in a sense, it doesn't, you, don't, you don't need to really think about this as providing an objective evaluation of you know, the quality of an English sentence. It's basically a discriminator between whether or not the sentence it observes belongs in the corpus or doesn't. This objective function penalizes you for also giving high scores to sentences which don't belong in your corpus and rewards you for producing sentences which do belong in your corpus by forcing you to try and maximize this difference. All right, yes. So, um, yeah, and the interpretation of, this, the, uh, of this, um, this kind of approach is that the representations you learn by optimizing, uh, by minimizing the loss, are representations which carry information about what the neighboring representations should look like in your sentence. So if the neighboring representations are something that express information that typically you would find grouped in the corpus, then it should give it a high score. And if the representations uh, provide information about something which doesn't look like it belongs there, like for example, your part of the sentence is about cats and the other part of the sentence is about computers. Actually, those are pretty frequently associated on the internet. Um, cats and medical operations. Um, then your representations should be sufficiently different to indicate to the scoring function that there's something wrong and that the score should be low. So this forces Sentence re this forces word representations to somehow encode information not just about the words, sim about the symbol itself, but about where it belongs. Does that make sense? That's quite hand wavy, but that's most machine learning for you. Um, and this sounds a lot like the distributional hypothesis we saw at the beginning. We are trying to learn representations that contain information about their, 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 their context, about the company. You're, you're learning a word by looking at the company it keeps. So this first, uh, this first stage of the model is, is fairly sensible, um, but it's deep in that you have to you have a convolutional neural network, you can have some nonlinearities, the score typically is a multilayer perceptron. It sounds a lot more complicated than it should be, and the convolutions capture very local information because typically they're looking at the neighboring few words because the sentences can have variable length. Um, a slightly more popular approach that is uh, still frequently used today is word to vec uh, that was introduced by Mikulov and his colleagues in 2013. And there are two variants to this model. Uh, the first one is called contextual bag of words, and then the other is called skipgram, and I'll describe these both now. The idea behind this is that um, instead of having a scoring function, which, as you pointed out in your question, is kind of strange as a concept, because what, what is the score of a sentence? What does, what, why should we have some sort of an uninterpretable score there? is to um, literally have the context predict the word. So we think of uh, the, the K words on the left and on the right of your target word, and uh, good embeddings of, the, of that context should produce, a, should, when fed into this model, be able to predict the word that's missing in the center um, or, predict, or have a distribution that's peaky around that particular word. So how this word is, we're gonna, we're gonna look at our context words pass them through an embedding matrix, which we're jointly training, and we're going to simply add them together. Um, we're going to have a uh, linear layer that's parametrized by the vocabulary size uh, and use that to project that hidden layer in the center that we've obtained from adding the word vectors back into the size of the vocabulary. So perhaps poorly represented on this diagram, but that top vector should be the number of words in your vocabulary. And then you're going to pass it through a soft max, which I've reminded you what that looks like mathematically here, um, in order to get a distribution over the vocabulary. Um, so we can think of that last vector as, give, of out, as outputting or as representing a distribution over what the target word should be given the context of that target word, given the, the observed context. Um, typic, the mathematical, oops, nope, that's the wrong thing, sorry. The mathematical representation is fairly simple, as you're going to put your one hot embeddings of the context of each context word through the embedding matrix and then project it. So because this, these are both matrices and there's no nonlinearity, you can see this as actually just one big matrix. But as an efficiency trick, you can actually move that projection matrix outside of the sum 
in order that you just take this, you're literally just taking the sum of the embeddings and only doing one matrix multiplication rather than k, um, if you have k context words. Um, we're going to train both the parameters of the projection, which are only there to predict the distributions, jointly with the embedding matrix, which produce the embeddings of the context words, simply by minimizing the negative log likelihood of the data. Um, so simply by iterating over each word in the data and uh, for each one calculating the log probability of that word given its context according to the model, summing through that and then minimizing the subjective, which you can do through backpropagation if you have an auto diff library. Well, there's not much need for backpropagation with this matrix multiplication. Um, so the advantages of this model in contrast with the Culliburton Western, uh, Western model that we saw previously is that everything is linear, it's very fast, and it's basically a very cheap way of applying one matrix to all inputs, but we split it into two matrices and get some efficiency out of summing the embeddings rather than doing that expensive uh, projection matrix a few times. Um, historically, this, uh, object, this, this model was trained by doing negative sampling instead of doing the expensive softmax, uh, although computers have gone significantly faster since 2013. Um, and we have good implementations of uh, softmax, of the softmax operation in a variety of libraries. So um, you get, the, it, it turns out that just doing negative log likelihood minimization is, is better. It's more stable and it's fast enough. Um, and there are several variants that you could imagine to this model. So if we look at the maths, we need to put this somewhere else. If we look at the maths in the previous slide, um, we have a single projection matrix per word. Um, but you could imagine saying, okay, that's not, that's not very rich. That's, I mean, it's cheap because we can move it out of the sum, but you know, a word that's one word to the left of our target word might be providing different information than a word that's two words to the left. Likewise, uh, if you had the syntactic uh, information, if you had a parse of the sentence, you might imagine that a verb is, predict is giving you different information about uh, one of its arguments than, for example, an adjective might. So you could, you could actually untie this, you could have a matrix that's actually dependent on either the position or the nature of the syntactic relation between the words. Um, one of the, so one of the variants which I quite liked is uh, uh, Ling et al. 2015 where they simply have position-specific uh, matrix per input. It's more expensive, um, but it, it gives you a richer kind of representation. Um, another variant on this is the Skipgram model, which is uh, also uh, under the word to vec uh, sort of header. And this is sort of turning the previous model on its head where the target word is predicting the context words. So the idea here is that you're going to embed the, 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 the target word with your embedding matrix, which again you're jointly training, and you're going to project that straight into the vocabulary and put it through a softmax. So that's putting, giving you a distribution over other words in the, in the vocabulary given that word. Um, and we're going to learn to estimate the likelihood of all the context words. So the li likelihood of a set of context words given the middle word, the, 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 your target word, um, separates out into, sorry, the log likelihood, uh, negative log likelihood, separates out into the log product of the probabilities of your context words given your uh, target word. Uh, and, and you can move the log through there and have a negative sum of the log probability of each target word, uh, each context word given the target. Um, so this is very fast. You only have one embedding operation versus um, uh, co uh, K or s size of your context. Um, and you can just read the probabilities off from the softmax at the end. And here there are similar, similar variants to contextual bag of words that are possible. You could have position specific projections uh, and obviously you're trading off between efficiency and a more structured notion of context if you do that, but you can learn ri richer representations through that. But one of the things that appeals to people because of that, uh, if, you, if you don't do that, is just the, just the relative simplicity of this model. It's easy to implement. There are a bunch of reference implementations in TensorFlow and Caress and uh, Dynet probably um, that you can look at. Yes? Yes, so 
is a good question. So this, this, this transformation plus your softmax is the theta in your model. These are just, it's just something that allows you to model that distribution given the representation. The embedding matrix, which again, I, I probably should have shown explicitly, is what allows you to obtain this dense vector here. Um, so you obtain that by putting your one hot of your, uh, uh, of your target word through the embedding matrix and then you project into the vocabulary. So in a sense, we, the, we, these models, uh, both the Colibar and Weston and both, skip, uh, both of the word to vec models have parameters that we don't really care about. I mean, we're not going to reuse them. Their only purpose is to estimate, to produce the scoring function. Um, but, um, and, and through that, allow us to model an objective which forces the overall model to learn a good representation. So that if the representations aren't rich, if they don't contain information about their context, you won't be able to predict the context word given the target word, you won't be able to produce a good score in the Calibro and Western case. And that's, that's kind of the point of the exercise. Does this make sense? Okay. So to quickly compare these um, sort of, people often refer to or to VEC is deep learning, but it's not. It's a completely shallow model. It's very, that's what's nice about it is it's fast. Um, but it has this sort of like neural flavor because we have a projection matrix. We implement them in the same libraries that we implement neural networks in. You can use backprop if you're really lazy, um, but there's, there, there, there are other ways of training them. Um, but these, when you compare them to count-based models, they actually are embodying the same sort of idea. We're trying to exploit the statistics of our data set, um, the sort of uh, regularity with which words co-occur in order to derive representations. And in fact, it's, it, goes, it goes deeper than just this high level similarity. In 2014, uh, Omer Levy and Yev Goldberg produced a really nice paper showing that word to vec as a model, I think it was Skip Graham rather than contextual bag of words, is actually equivalent to learning the PMI matrix factorization of count-based models, which is one of the normalization uh, methods of normalizing uh, count-based models, which I discussed but didn't discuss in detail. And if you care exactly about the detail of this uh, theoretical result, then uh, I invite you to read the paper. Um, and uh, following that publication, which showed that effectively you aren't only just doing the same thing on a high level, but you're actually doing the same thing mathematically, um, Omer Levy and colleagues produced a follow-up paper where they compared um, PMI matrix factorization, uh, word to vec Carlberg and Weston, and some other slightly more involved uh, embeddings learning methods, which I won't cover in this lecture, and show that if you had all the right, all these hyper, all the hyperparameters for each of these methods, and you optimize them correctly um, by grid searching or by brute force. Um, then they have roughly equivalent performance. They're not really distinguishable. Um, this isn't to say this isn't an interesting area of research, but there were a lot of papers that made pretty strong claims about how they had a new, better, global way of producing word representations. And it turns out that if you tune them just the right way, they're, they're hard to distinguish. This isn't to say that some aren't easier to train than others, which is important. So the benefits of these neural approaches are that they're easy to learn. Uh, with good linear algebra libraries, and in, in particular with uh, uh, auto differentiation libraries like Dynad or TensorFlow, it's very simple to implement these in a few lines of code. And again, there are reference implementations for most of these online. Um, uh, especially with regard to models like the word to vec models, um, they're highly parallelizable. Uh, with mini batching, with GPUs, with distributed models, you can train these very quickly across a, a large amount of data. Um, one, what's nice with both count based and with neural models is you don't have to predict just other words. You could imagine variants where you're predicting other aspects of context. Uh, these might be discrete, so you might be predicting what sort of dependencies you observe in the context if you had data that was dependency parsed. You could predict pause tags, you can predict anything like that. And while you can estimate these probabilities with counts, it can quickly become hard um, due to sparsity. But the appeal of these, uh, of, of the objective-based methods like word to vec 
where you're predicting the likelihood of the context, is you can also do this over continuous context. So for example, if you had data that paired sentences with images, you could predict pixels, the probability of pixels given your sentence, and somehow put the information of the image in the word. Is it that simple? Not really, but I mean, these, it, opens the, it opens the door to these kind of uh, richer notions of context that are definitely harder to address with count-based methods. So how do we evaluate these word representations? Well, there's a bunch of data sets. Some are good and some not so good. Um, first, there's WordSim 353, which is just, um, actually, I can't remember the details of it. It's a, it's a set of pairs of words, and you have, to, you, have to, and you have human reference scores, and you have to see how well your model uh, similarity scores align with those. Um, it's been around for a while since 2003, and there have been so many papers published on it that the sort of research community has collectively hill climbed over this data set, and it's not, it's, it's still a good sanity check, but it's not necessarily the best way of evaluating word vectors. Um, Simlex 999 uh, is a similar kind of word similarity uh, sort of bench, uh, data set that you can use to evaluate your representations. It was produced in 2000, it was published in 2016 by Hill and Al. It's been around since 2014, um, but that's kind of the same flavor as WordSim 353. Um, in um, in uh, word, the Word to Vec paper, uh, Thomas Mikulov presents this word analogy task where you have like X's to Y, like Y's to Z. Uh, and he showed that you could solve these analogy problems simply by using vector arithmetic. So there's this famous example that you hear people you, uh, refer to all the time within the context of Word to Vec, which is that the vector for queen can be obtained by uh, subtracting the vector for king from man and adding the vector, no, this is the wrong way around, sorry, I've copied this from a website. Um, <laughs> the vector for queen can be obtained by subtracting the vector uh, for man from the vector for king and adding the vector for woman. Um, so you're basically saying, take a king, re remove the information that identifies the, the male gender. This is in a very hand wavy sense. We're not making a deep statement about kings and queens here, but uh, more about the statistics of these words. Uh, and add the information about women, and you should obtain a vector that is close in the vector space, where this nearest neighbor is the vector for queen. Yes? What are your thoughts on why the statistics cause that property to happen? Uh, I'm guessing, I mean, so we, from more indirect uh, observation than that other people have run experiments on this, you find that words that are very frequent, so that are ahead of the Zipfian distribution, um, you find this behavior is quite robust, and then for rarer words, uh, it, it doesn't occur as much. Uh, you don't ne necessarily have a robust performance. Uh, one interpretation could be that the, if you remove basically the contextual, the, the contextual information, you're removing from the, vec the vector king the contextual information that identifies uh, the uh, man by subtracting the man vector, and, by, and then you're re-adding the contextual information that sort of predicts woman, or that woman predicts, and that is sort of equivalent in a sort of, it, it, by, by tr uh, it's equivalent to like the contextual information that queen predicts. That's very hand wavy, but uh, yeah, that's, that's the best explanation I can probably muster up. Um, yes. So one, so this, but this, this is a nice sort of. It's more than just taking pairwise similarities between words and actually doing a sort of simple reasoning task, although it's a very superficial one. Um, but it's quite popular to evaluate word representations uh, these days. And finally, you can get a qualitative evaluation um, of your vectors by simply using a projection algorithm. So uh, a popular way of projecting these high dimensional vectors, even though they're dense embeddings, you're no longer talking about 10,000 dimensional vectors or ve vectors the size of your vocabulary, but you project them into a smaller space the size of which you can control as a hyperparameter. Um, there's still more than three dimensions, so it's difficult to picture anything beyond three dimensions. Or, you know, or on a sheet of paper, it's difficult to portray even that. So there are algorithms like T-SNE, um, which allow you to project high dimensional spaces into two dimensional spaces and then observe um, how words cluster. Uh, and I took, again, I stole this from Chris Ola's blog post, which is fantastic actually. You can just read this blog post and you'll get most of the contents of this lecture, I think. Um, and you see that if you project things that numbers occupy a particular side, part of the space that's closer than other words, uh, that words like uh, minister, leader, president, that you just, uh, re representations that you produce from, I can't remember what the corpus was, but if you looked at a, a large collection of web pages, you would plausibly find that words like president, leader, minister are close together. Um, 
would be a good time for a witty political comment, but I don't have any. Um, but and then and so this is the sort of eva quality of evaluation should be taken with a grain of salt. Tsne is something where you can it, there's a bit of ran there's some aspect of randomness to it. If you hit refresh or like regenerate your projections, you typically will land with you know one that looks kind of good and that you can overinterpret, and that's what people do in papers sometimes. But uh, if you're training a model and you want to, intuitions about what your representations are expressing, it's still nice to observe that hey. Sometimes if I hit TSNE, if I run TSNE enough, they actually do cluster in a way that is matching my intuitions and you can therefore introspect into your high dimensional representations without having to read out the numbers directly. So these are kind of, these, this collection of like uh, evaluations are something you could call intrinsic evaluations. They're, they're evaluating whether the words themselves uh, cluster in sensible ways or have uh, particular geometric relations in the case of the analogy tasks. Um, but you're evaluating the words, the, the, those representations kind of in isolation or pairwise. Um, and there, it's an intrinsic kind of evaluation. Another way of evaluating the representations you learn with this would simply to be, uh, use, as we'll see in the rest of the course, uh, we have different sort of architectures we can feed these into to generate other sentences or classify them or predict some aspect of, the, of a document. And an extrinsic evaluation is simply, do the embeddings that you trained help you perform this end task better? Are they good general purpose representations? And we'll talk about this a little bit later in this lecture, but also this will be um, part of the content of the rest of the course. Yes? Yeah, um, as I pointed out, I, I, I copied this, web, this from this web page, and I think they made a mistake here. So this should be king minus man plus woman equals queen. Um, I'm pretty sure. Oh, I'll, I'll double, I'm going to double check this in the original paper and fix the, fix the slide. Um, OK, so we've seen um, the sort of general intuition behind uh, learning vectors by counting context words. We've seen a sort of more, um, more neural network inspired approach for estimating them based on maximizing scores or likelihoods. Um, and finally, I want to talk a little bit at the, to, to wrap up this lecture about uh, task-based embedding learning. Um, so um, one use for this uh, embedding matrix following upon my comments uh, upon for, for extrinsic evaluation is to treat the embeddings as input features to a neural network over words. So we, we want to not just use these word representations to compare or cluster words, but we want to use them as input to um, functions over continuous representations and do something with it, predict, classify, generate. Um, and uh, if, we're, if you think about that, that, that input, that this input process, this input operation is just another matrix multiplication of which we might have many in a neural network. So in a sense, the embedding matrix itself is just another parameter in your overall neural network. Since we update neural network parameters um, by uh, doing gradient descent over, um, but sorry, by, up, by, by taking the gradient of the parameter, of the loss with regard to the parameters and, uh, and updating the previous state of the parameters, we can just do this to the embedding matrix based on our task specific loss. So if I'm, let's say, predicting uh, labels Y from inputs X based on the parameters of my network. If I optimize the parameters of my network, I might as well just optimize everything else, including my embeddings. So you can think of the, a, a sensible approach might be simply train, directly train the embeddings jointly with the other parameters of the network which uses them. And the general intuition behind this um, is that we are not only learning to predict or, or classify or generate uh, based on these embeddings as features, but we're jointly learning the features themselves. We're, we're trying to find out what the salient features are for my task. Um, this embeddings matrix that we use as just another set of parameters in the network uh, could be learned from scratch. So we could just randomly initialize it and, and just learn it based on the task. Or we could initialize it with embeddings we learned from some other source, like word to vec over another corpus. Especially if, if we have a lot more data that is unlabeled. We could just simply train word to, a word to vec model on that and use the embeddings matrix to initialize the embedding matrix of our task specific model. So this is often referred to as fine tuning. Um, I'll give you a few examples of this to wrap up. 
Um, so, for example, uh, so we're going to talk about bag of words classifiers because we're going to talk about slightly more involved models later in the, in the course. Um, so we'll keep it simple here. Um, we want to classify um, sentences or documents that have a, a variable number of words in them into uh, a particular set of classes. For example, whether or not a tweet is a positive sentiment or expresses a negative sentiment about a politician. Or whether or not a movie review is one star, two star, three to five star. Or perhaps uh, we have a finite set of topics or, or, or document classes and we want to predict which uh, of these classes an email belongs to, whether it's about computers or about religion. Um, so the simplest approach to um, classifying is a bag of vectors approach. Um, simply, we're going to uh, embed all the words in our document with our embedding matrix, and we're going to sum them, so we're not taking into account word order or any sort of uh, compositional relationships between them, and we're going to project that into our classes. Once we've projected, we want to yield a probability distribution over the classes, so we'll simply softmax. Um, and this, uh, you, know, you can have a simple kind of like linear model like this, where you simply embed and then have a simple transformation. You could make it arbitrarily complex, obviously, by having a convolutional neural network over the inputs or a multilayer perceptron, and it's really up to you. But the same approach um, is, is universal across all these things. We embed first, then we pass it through a bunch of transformations into our classes. This kind of bag of, word class, bag of vector classifier is, is fairly simple to implement and train. I gave you a few example tasks earlier, sentiment analysis, document classification, uh, author identification, whatever you have data for, you can do this for. And by, turn, by, by training or fine tuning our embeddings uh, based on the end task, you can think of um, the embeddings en encompassing or internalizing task specific features. Uh, if your end task is classifying the sentiment of a tweet, you can think about you know, individual word representations, internalizing whether or not that's a word that is indicative of like, you know, positive sentiment or negative sentiment. Um, so the word meaning in this kind of context is grounded by the task, grounded in the task. The task gives it meaning. Um, but this doesn't really give you, this kind of approach doesn't give you any notion of words in context. We're just summing them together and then classifying. And that seems pretty weak because in language, typically words gather meaning by being existing in a context. Uh, that's how we resolve ambiguity or the polysemy and we, de we determine which, which particular meaning of a word is salient in a particular context. Um, also, everything um, in this kind of s simple approach, every word in the document contributes to the uh, end product to the classification. So uh, if you have more words, then you have the risk of incorporating more noise into your model. <coughs> Finally, grounding this, this way of learning word representations by grounding them in classification tasks could yield quite shallow semantics. I mean, obviously, it's good that your word representations would internalize the notion of positive or negative sentiment in sentiment classification, but there's obviously more to the meaning of the word good than whether or not it expresses a positive or negative sentiment. There's more to the word CPU than the fact that it's a reliable predictor of the topic computer if you were doing document classification. So uh, another approach to, and this is a, the, the final approach we're discussing in this lecture, uh, another approach to learning in a task specific setting fairly general word representations is to form an objective where you need to learn something that's, you need, you, where you need to, uh, sorry, where the objective reflects something linguistically general. Um, and the example, and one example of a fairly simple objective that does this is a paper by Herman and Blunsum in 2014, uh, where the task is recognizing whether or not uh, two sentences, um, one in German and one in English, express the same uh, meaning. Um, so whether or not they're aligned in a corpus or not. We're not talking about word specific alignment, we're just saying whether or not these two sentences are roughly a translation of another. So consider a data set of uh, English sentences and their German translations. So we have the, everything's paired uh, by, and, and we assume that the data set has the English sentence is roughly the same meaning as the German sentence it's paired with. And we want to produce representations of the, Eng vector representations of the English and the German sentence such that the similarity between these vectors is maximized. We're going to use a simple objective of maximizing the similarity to train embedding matrices for the English and the German sentence 
sorry, for the words of the English sentence and the words of the German sentence, and then we can use these embedding matrices um, for whatever task we want later on. And I'll talk a bit about why this is a gen nice general purpose objective. Um, there are a bunch of different ways you could compose the word vectors to produce a representation of the sentence. And throughout the course, you'll see some very sophisticated ones We're using recurrent neural networks, convolutional neural networks. Uh, but we'll talk about the simplest composition functions that were used in the paper. Obviously, you could just add them. Or you could try and capture some aspect of word order. So for example, you could uh, take uh, constant, like um, collocated pairs of words, so a word in its next word, and just put a nonlinearity on that. So it no longer, you're no longer just taking a sum of all the words in the sentence, but you have a moving window over the sentence, and you're applying a nonlinearity to each pair of words. Um, this is a very, fairly trivial way of capturing some notion of word order. Um, but as I said, it's not the most sophisticated thing you could do. So we have simple ways of producing a representation for the English sentence from its words or the German sentence from its words. Obviously, sorry, this should be in the embedding of TI and the embedding of, of TJ, sorry, and of TJ plus one. Um, so an obvious loss would be simply to minimize the difference between the English, the distance between the English vector and the German vector. So if these, or if, if when you compose the word representations, you obtain the same vector, this, the norm of this overall difference vector goes towards zero. Let me take the squared norm. But this has an obvious degenerate solution. Uh, so if the objective is to minimize this loss, the simplest solution would be for the model to simply <coughs> learn that every word has the representation zero. So that when you add them together or do the slightly more complex composition function, you trivially minimize this loss. And this is, again, going back to what we talked about in the Colburn West uh, method where we're predicting a score. It's important to think about what these degenerate solutions might be. And we want to ensure that the objective is designed such that the only way to minimize the objective is for you to learn meaningful representations. So you can avoid the degenerate solution with a similar approach to the Colburn Weston objective. So we're going to do a noise contrasted margin based loss, which is a bit like a hinge loss. And we're going to basically um, take for each sentence, for each pair of sentences, English and German I, we're going to sample another sen German sentence from the corpus, a different German sentence from the corpus, which is now a distractor. And we want to uh, maximize the difference between our, uh, the, the, this distance and this distance such that it's more than m. So if you were to think about it this way, if you have the degenerate solution and everything's mapped to zero, um, this will be, the, the norm here will be zero, the norm here will be zero, and then you'll have, you'll, you'll not have, uh, you'll have this margin that stays. So you'll have, um, you won't have minimized your overall loss. What you want to do instead is ensure that the similarity, the distance between your distractor and the, sen and the English sentence representation and the English and the German sentence representation is at least your margin. Um, M here is just a hyperparameter. So if you increase the margin, you're saying that the model needs to be increasingly discriminatory about uh, distractor sentences. And if you make it smaller, it's, it, it doesn't matter as much. So the intuition behind what happens when you minimize your loss here is that aligned sentences between English and German share the same high level meaning if one is a translation of the other, if they have the same meaning to us humans. So to minimize this objective loss, um, the embeddings have to be able to accurately, or at least somewhat, reflect the high-level meaning of the sentence in which they occur in order to minimize the loss while also modeling their context. So this is a nice example of a task-based objective, which is simple, uh, fairly simple to implement. <laughs> but unlike doing sentiment analysis or document classification, uh, you're learning a fairly general notion of word embedding. You're using another language as a sort of grounding for English representations and vice versa. So these models are very simple. There are many other options. Um, sorry, how much time do I have left? Um, a little over time. I'll wrap up. Um, so these models are all very, all very simple, and that's not a bad thing. I mean, it's easy to think about overly complicated ways of learning embeddings, um, but ultimately, um, very simple approaches are easy to train and uh, have been shown to be fairly robust. So. Um, it's not necessarily good to just immediately jump to something more complex. Um, but it doesn't really address all the aspects of language that we'd want to capture. Um, 
when all these models uh, uh, for classification and even uh, for detecting similarity between English and German sentences don't really do anything in terms of capturing the relation between words about the like disambiguating words, looking at the context and how they would affect selecting the meaning of a particular word. So, um, oh my, I forgot to finish this slide. Um, <laughs> this is what we're going to be discussing in the rest of the course. How can we use these embeddings um, as the input to more complex neural architectures um, and uh, in, in order to um, solve more complex tasks. So to wrap up, um, task-based embeddings are nice because they capture information salient to the task, um, but this doesn't guarantee that you're going to learn general meaning. Um, you're going to learn me only the meaning or only the sort of representational information that is useful for that particular task. You could overcome this by using a multitask objective, but uh, by sort of for using the same representations to classify, to classify documents, to predict sentiment, um, but that has its own difficulties. Um, yeah, let me just let me just wrap up here actually. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, uh, the, so what I'd like to finish, yeah, what I'd like to finish on is how, how these vectors will be used in, in other parts of the course. Um, you can think of learning and reusing word vectors. So if you pre-train them or if you learn them on tasks as a form of transfer learning, you're transferring information from the objective that you use to train them. So in word vector predicting the context or having the context predict the target word. And you're saying that this is a nice general purpose representation that you can use um, to produce, pr provide features for other neural networks. Um, generally speaking, if you have enough, you'll see in the rest of the course, if you have enough training data and vocabulary coverage, it's generally better to just train the embeddings directly on your task. If you're learning a translation model, uh, it's just you can randomly initialize your word vectors and then uh, learn your English and German vectors based on how well uh, English translates into German. But if you don't have very good vocabulary coverage, um, if, for example, in your train, you have a, a very small amount of training data, then you might benefit from uh, learning your word representations using word to vec on a larger amount of uh, unlabeled data. Yeah, I'm just going to end here, actually. Are there any questions? Yes. Uh, I had a question about the German and English um, sentence. Yeah. Because uh, uh, it used uh, Euclidean distances for the sentence vectors. Mm -hmm. Um, in the, 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 you mean the German and English ta task? No, you simply use that. You want to minimize the distance. Yeah, you, you could use the cosine measure. Yeah. So this is you could yeah sorry you could approach yeah so that was just an arbit that's an arbitrary choice that they made in their particular model. But you could the same hinge loss the same max margin objective could be used if you took the cosine between the English and the German sentence and the English and the distractor sentence and wanted to maximize that margin. Yes. Yeah. Is there a reason why we should model this in words as living in the same space? Um, well, you could model different words in different spaces, but I mean, the generic idea is that you're going to be provide the, the the representations you're learning are going to serve as input to a neural network. If you um, if you have like pos, if you have like the part of speech information, you might want to feed in words uh, based on the part of speech into different uh, as different. Yeah, you could you could feed those into different parts of a network. For example, um, I haven't seen anyone do this, so this is an example off the top of my head. In which case, yes, you could represent those with like different length vectors. But typically, um, if you look at the bag of vectors approach, if the vectors aren't of the same dimensionality, if they're not in the same vector space then adding them is not a valid operation, Class of, then, and therefore you can't obtain a single representation of your document and you can't classify that. So there is a general purpose to having them all be in the same space because you're, you're, learning that, you're jointly learning that feature space alongside with how you use it. Okay, uh, yes? Has anyone done adversarial embedding? It seems like a similar task to uh, the Possibly, I don't. I don't think I've come across. Chris Dyer might be a good person to answer this question since he's read more, a lot more about embeddings than I have in the last few years. Any, are there any adversarial approaches to embedding learning? Yeah. 
then more towards how do you get really scalable models uh, on uh, really big data sets, so sort of simpler models, or how do you condition on sort of new kinds of information, uh, like say uh, you know, the multimodal stuff that uh, Ed mentioned, or translations into a second language, or social context, or things like that. And that's where some of the more interesting uh, modeling work comes in, but then because the focus is more on sort of this new data, uh, people aren't particularly uh, sort of uh, using these very sort of exotic uh, uh, learning objectives. <coughs> but I think there's some really interesting, uh, uh, there's certainly a paper in there. If you want to okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs>